So today I want to talk about allowing God to open our eyes to see him more and more. Sounds like a good idea. Who wants to see God more and more? Yeah. So last week, <clears throat> we celebrated that incredible feast time of Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And one of the things I spoke about, and you can catch up on YouTube, is, so I'm just, there we go, is how there was a variety of mixed kind of reactions and emotions to the resurrection, the physical resurrection of Jesus. What was staring people in the face did not make sense. And part of what happens with people encountering the risen Jesus is their inability to see who he is, even though he's right in front of them. That's still the same today. Jesus is still risen. But for example, we looked at Mary Magdalene, who was on her own in the garden, where the empty tomb was. And in John 20, verse 14, we saw this. It said, at this she turned around at seeing the empty tomb. She turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you put him and I'll get him. She knows who Jesus is, yet she sees and talks to Jesus and fails to see who he is. And the last time she saw him, he was beaten and bloodied from crucifixion. In fact, he was dead. And she thinks this guy is the gardener. This couldn't be Jesus because she never expected this. And verse 16, Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. And we saw last week that on hearing her name, Mary's eyes and heart were opened to see Jesus was actually there with her. I want to then just follow on to the story of the road to Emmaus, Luke 24, verse 13. It says, that same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. That's so cool, isn't it? But God kept them from recognizing him. God kept them from recognizing him. So Jesus is walking with them, but they don't recognize him. They talk all about what's happened with Jesus, uh, along with their hopes and dreams, their confusion, their disappointment, and continue saying in verse 22, then some women from our group of his followers were at the tomb early this morning and they came back with an amazing report. They said the body was missing and they had seen angels who told them, Jesus is alive. And some of our men ran out to see and sure enough his body was gone just as the women had said. So they'd heard that this has happened, the missing body, Jesus is alive, yet they're not believing it. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That was some connect group that they had. I'd like to be in that one. You know, it's the same for us today, but it's so much easier for us in that it's been spelled out more clearly for us. You know, essentially, what Jesus told them, and much more, is all here in the Bible. So we have it much easier. All we need for godly living, to begin to understand who God is, to get to know who Jesus is, to live this life in the power of the Spirit. But do we get it? Do we believe it? And I sadly have to ask in these days, in fact, what do we believe? Because it seems that not everyone is seeing the same thing as we look in this book, despite its clarity. 
So verse 28, by this time they were nearing a mess, and at the end of the journey, Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's going to get late. So he went home with them. <coughs> as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. That's cool too, the first communion after his resurrection. Fancy being part of that communion. Well, our communion was good, but imagine that. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. Oh, they just recognize him and he disappears. What a moment as the fog lifts. God allowed revelation to come to them as they saw that Jesus was alive and was with them. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? I love that kind of uh, Bible study where your hearts are burning, where you're just so excited at, at, at what's happening. I love how this book is alive, it's living. You can read it and reread it and it speaks to us again and again, bringing greater understanding, sometimes loudly and clearly, and sometimes it seems like a whisper we can hardly hear. But it's just like, unlike any other book. It's a book of revelation. As our eyes are opened again and again to new things and to his presence with us. So these two followers of Jesus then run to see the other disciples and tell them what's happened when suddenly Jesus appears among the disciples. Verse 38. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it really is me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and his feet. And still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. And I wonder what your reaction would be. As I say, it's always great looking back in hindsight at these stories, thinking, well, I wouldn't have done that. But I bet in the moment, I mean, I love it. They, were, they doubted, and yet they were filled with joy and wonder. And I said last week that to, for us to encounter and meet Jesus, to recognize him, really requires a change of mindset within us to acknowledge who he is. But we also need God to give us that understanding, that revelation and ability to see who he is. We're not going to understand God by natural means alone. Creation, in one sense, is the natural lens helping us to see there's a creator God. But, <coughs> but to really know God, who is supernatural, means that we need our spiritual eyes open too. It's not enough just to look at creation. That's like a doorway. The Apostle Paul, who used to be called Saul, he became Paul, was one of the first passionate persecutors of Christians and the church. And one day, on his way to arrest followers of Jesus in the city of Damascus, Paul was struck down by a blinding light and physically blinded. And he encountered the risen Jesus who spoke to him and told him to stop resisting him. Three days later, a disciple called Ananias goes to Paul, he prays for him. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized, and his sight was restored. And immediately he began preaching the good news about Jesus. Now that restoration of his physical eyesight symbolized Paul's inner transformation as the eyes of his heart were enlightened to see the truth of who Jesus is. And then years later, the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And he writes this in Ephesians 1 verse 17. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. 
I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Just meditate on that verse this week, or those verses. What a prayer he was praying for them. And quite honestly, that is a prayer that many church leaders pray for their people again and again, because we're not playing games. We want reality, and the reality is this, that we can only know God essentially by His revelation. That's why we seek to know the presence of God in a tangible way in our lives, and also as we gather to worship, as we, as we gather as a church, as we gather as connect group, gather as the women, as the men. So often God's presence can be thought of in kind of a mystical way to the point that it's like an atmosphere. Oh, we want the presence of God. We want the atmosphere of God. But God is more than just an atmosphere. For example, Dan, stand up. Thank you. Make yourself known. Yeah. Now, how do we know that Dan is here? Because he just stood up. He made himself known. We can see him. He's real. Thank you, Dan. God reveals himself to us in ways that we can understand. And then it's up to us to respond to him. That's because relationship is a two-way street. Knowing something or knowing someone comes in different levels of depth as well. We can be asked about how well we know someone who we think is close to us or someone who's just an acquaintance to us, and we respond that we know them in different ways. And sometimes we can think we know someone really well, then they surprise us, causing us to wonder whether we really did know them at all. How many of you ever experienced that? Yeah. Knowing Jesus is a daily journey, sometimes so full of mystery, and at other times so simplistically clear. But one thing that is clear is that God wants us not just to know him, but to know him better. And in knowing him better, to know who we are to become better, as he intended. To know him better, we will know who we're meant to become better. When the disciples started out on their journey of following Jesus, they found out that not only did they change over the three years that they spent with Jesus in his ministry, but their understanding of him changed too. And this should be the same for us as well. You see, if we're not changing as a result of our relationship with God, then we need to ask ourselves, why aren't we? Or whether we truly encountered him. Or why are we resisting him? So back to Ephesians 1, 7. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know him better. The Greek here is interesting in that it can be a spirit of, or the, the spirit, capital S. I'm going to do that right for you. In other words, really what's being said here is that God will give you wisdom and revelation that's possessed by and comes from the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Either, either way, if it's a spirit or the spirit, its aim is the same. And that's really why it's good to have a, a, a prayer. God, help me to know you better. Help me to know you better. Not just to know you. All relationships are good, but they're better if you get to know one another better, aren't they? They're more enjoyable. We will never fully understand God, but he does want us to understand him more and more. But it's not enough just to have revelation. Wisdom's also needed too, because we need to know what to do with what we come to know and experience about God. Let me give you an example. I can be looking at an oven 
and I may not know what to do with it, but I get a manual, I read it, it says if you switch on off the wall, if you switch these knobs, heat's going to come on. So I do that and I see the element come on, I can feel the heat coming, I am now enlightened. But how I cook well with it is another matter. We all know how to turn on an oven, but can we cook well with it? We can know about God, but what do we do? What wisdom do we have in applying that experience of revelation? Psalm 111 verse 10 says, The fear or the reverence or awe of the Lord is the beginning or foundation of wisdom. All those who follow his precepts, his commands, have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. True wisdom will help point us to God and what he wants. So one of the ways that we can know God better is to look at what he said in his word. Take this prayer, for example, from Psalm 119, verse 18. Open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law, in your word. If you want to know him better, ask him for help. When you read the word, ask him for help. Pray that prayer. Open my eyes to see wonderful things in your word. So I pray that the eyes of your heart, your innermost being, may be enlightened. It speaks of um, a light coming on, illumination coming, understanding coming. In the dark, it's hard to make things out, but when you turn the light on, understanding comes. In order that you may know, you may comprehend and understand the hope to which he's called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. God's revelation of who he is has purpose. It's not just a nice idea or experience to have. It's to help us, to help know him better. And to understand and grasp all that he's given to us, to made available to us. Now thankfulness is so important, isn't it? Thankfulness brings recognition and understanding of all we are and all we have and all that's good. Unthankfulness creates vacuum and emptiness, even becoming destructive. Now, the Bible teaches us to ask God to meet our needs. Jesus taught that in the, in the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Give us our daily bread. The Bible teaches us to pray and ask for things with an attitude of thankfulness. But there's a tension that we've got to hold. The tension is this. The danger is we can ask God for more and more blessings every day and ignore all, all that he's blessed us with already. You get that? We can ask for more and more every day, but actually ignore all he's blessed us with already. We can be unthankful for what we have, like kids who are not satisfied but just ask for more. And the flip side is that we can also take for granted we have everything we need in Christ, but do nothing with it. We have everything in Christ, but we do nothing. So, let me just grab this bucket of balls. It's full. I'm blessed. Oh, God, give me more. I want more of you. I want more of you. Oh, I just want to know. I want to experience you. And all it is is I'm consuming, consuming, consuming. I just want a bigger bucket. There's nothing wrong with wanting more of God. But we need to be thankful for what he's given and use what we have. But I can also be like, I've been blessed, so what? So what, you know, God's done this for me. So what, as God, you know, he does this. We can be so unthankful. This is why testimony is good. This is why I keep saying, guys, let me hear your stories. I want to hear the stories of what God's done for you. I don't want you just keeping asking God for more. Let's hear what God's done. Let's encourage ourselves with what he's done. This prayer is about comprehending 
what God's already done for us and blessed us with. So what do we comprehend of what God's done for us and given us? Just think about that. What do I comprehend about that? So that you may know, you may comprehend, you may understand the hope to which he's called you. Biblical hope has a certainty to an, an expectation, a certain expectation. It's not like just, I hope the bus arrives, or I hope this happens. There's a sense of certainty to it. And he, God, has called us into a living hope, so we're not alone. He is with us, even when it feels he isn't. We have a hope of a certain future. We have the hope that he is a faithful God and will always be true to his word. We have a hope that he's almighty God, able to change our circumstances and accomplish all he's promised. <coughs> we have a hope that he's a gracious God, willing to forgive all our sin and work all things together for our good if we love him. Can you comprehend that? That's what Paul's praying. Then he's praying that you would comprehend the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Inheritance often speaks of something promised when someone's died. Well, Jesus died. The inheritance is ours. But we don't have to wait till we die. We can start enjoying the inheritance of all that God has given us in Christ now. He's a generous God who's freely given us all that we need in Jesus. It's promised for us, the hope of eternal life. He wants us to live in this future inheritance now and take advantage of it. It's not a vague or distant hope, but is for today, even though there's still more to come, because that's the generosity and extravagance of God. Yes, in the future, it will all be perfect, but even now, we can experience His goodness. And can we comprehend His incomparably great power for us who believe? His power for us who believe can compare with nothing else. Can you comprehend that? All that God is, all the power of God is for you and with you. You do not have to be afraid. You do not have to fear. You do not have to be overcome. He's called you to overcome. The power of salvation and freedom from sin. Knowing deliverance and healing. God's will isn't just that we know Him, but that we come to know Him better. That's why He poured out His Holy Spirit, His very presence in the hearts of His followers. And then part of knowing God better is to do the things that please Him. When you know someone, you know what they like, don't you? And you know what they don't like. As kids, they know how to rub each other the wrong way. And, the, and sometimes when they get older, they can still do that. We can do that with each other. Or we can really bless each other and encourage each other. Or when someone's down, we can see it and we can help one another. One thing that Jesus called us to is discipleship. People often think that church, I, th I think in this culture, people think church is about fun. Is it nice for me? Does it scratch my itch? Is it good? Do I like this? Do I like that? No, well, that's not for me. I'm going to go where I like it. But the Christian life is not about fun. Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. But I've overcome. I'm with you. And discipleship is, is, is about challenge. And discipleship is challenging in today's culture, which doesn't like to be told anything, or even takes great offense at being challenged on things we find uncomfortable or we don't want. And having a spirit of wisdom and revelation isn't just about having some ecstatic experience, some spirit-filled goosebump encounter, but it's about perceiving and understanding what God's will is for us, and then putting that into action. As Romans 12, 1 and 2, talks about presenting ourselves a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. That's our spiritual act of worship, that we're transformed by the renewing of our minds. So yes, there's this tension between praying and asking God for more in breakthrough and asking God to be filled with the Spirit and moving the gifts of the Spirit, attention that we 
we live with and actually accessing what he's given us already. You can be asking God for something he's already given you. You just haven't recognized it. You just haven't used it. Stop asking. Dip into the bucket and see what he's got you. He's blessed us. Essentially, it's like opening the presents and the gifts which he's given us already. Sometimes we can be asking for more, not recognizing what he's done. And we don't even ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand how to do some of these things or, or use the gifts that he's given. Let's ask him. He's there for us. Maybe we're just ignoring what he's given and wanting other things because what he gave, we might not want. What he said, we might not want to hear. It might not be the challenge we wanted to hear from God. It might not be the direction we wanted to go in that we're hearing God might want us to go in. It might not be the way I want to use my money, the money that God's actually given me, so it's actually his money. I know personally I've asked him to provide financially for us in the past when we're in difficult situations, but what God actually wanted me to do was learn how to use my finances well and give from a place of responsibility. Because that is what he's like. I know I've ex asked to experience more of his presence, like it coming on me, when sometimes really what I needed to do was take time and create a space to be in his presence because he was there already just waiting for me to come. You know, it can be lazy, it'll do it for me. No, you do it and you will benefit more from it. I was looking for some quick fix external experience rather than coming before him, carving out time. Maybe, <coughs> maybe I want God to speak to me, waiting for someone to bring a word, a prophetic word they felt was from God, rather than actually getting into the word, which I already had, picking up a Bible, and asking God to open my eyes as to what he was saying. And then maybe have someone come and confirm. God wants us to grow. To get to know him better is about us growing, not just having ecstatic or wonderful experiences or having fun. So he, he prays that our hearts would be enlightened, that we would see that we have been blessed with an incredible hope. We have been blessed with an incredible inheritance. We have been blessed with his power. And the bottom line is, what he really wants is for us to get to know him better and recognize the riches of all that he has already provided for us. Amen. As Martin was just sharing that, I've got a sense, um, I felt like God was saying that there's two groups of people here, um, for some that, that both feel that they're estranged from God, that they're, they're separated from God. One of those groups feel like there's something that's, that they've done that's between God and them. That they hear Martin talking and think, that sounds great, but what about this that I've done? And the other group feel that God's let them down, that something has happened to them, and God, God has seen them in that suffering, that they feel, where were you, God, when that happened to me? And that is a barrier between them and God. And what God is saying is that now, here today, He wants to reconnect with you over those things. That this is where He wants to reconcile those things between you and him, so that he can meet with you and give you that abundant life that Martin's talking about. Do you want to just pray for that? Yeah. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would rest on our hearts now. You are a gracious God. You do not punish us for the sins as we deserve. You are compassionate, slow to anger, and you have suffered 
you know what it is to suffer. Thank you that you're willing to be with us. I pray that your spirit would rest on us now. Help us to respond to you and encounter your love, your compassion and your grace. Amen.